Right. I hope I hope uh, you can all you can all hear me. Um, I'm David Moss, and I'm a member of the anthropology department at SOAS. And I'm going to say something about the department, but really what I'm going to do is give you a bit of a taster lecture. And the the focus of the lecture, or the the uh, uh, purpose of the lecture, is to is to tell you something about what what anthropology is. How might, how might we distinguish anthropology from other uh, disciplines, other social sciences, and other um, uh, other subjects? Um, of course, I'd like to be able to do this in a more interactive way, and I would normally do that um, because anthropology is a discipline that is often um, where, in which we learn um, significantly through through interactions. Uh, however, we're stuck with this, and I'm going to I'm going to give you the lecture, and then hopefully there'll be time for questions, and I can talk about. Um, studying as a, uh, as a postgraduate at SOAS and, and um, maybe reference some of the different MA programs that you may be interested in or have already um, uh, applied or registered for. So um, the anthropology department at SOAS is one of the leading departments in the country and SOAS is in fact a rather special place in which to study anthropology because as you will discover the department is located in perhaps what is the world's largest concentration of regional specialists in the humanities and social sciences anywhere. So as anthropologists, we find many interconnections between the different fields of history, of politics, of literature, of religion, um, while providing a distinctive focus uh, in our own subject. Sometimes so as itself can feel like one big anthropology department. And unlike many bigger universities, so as anthropology is really at the center of the school and one of its most important subject areas, connecting out to history, to development studies, the study of religions, and law, politics, and of course, the many languages and literatures that are taught at SOAS, which give depth to our work all in a university that is small enough for these connections to really count for something. But what is anthropology? And I think specifically, uh, the question is, what is social and cultural anthropology? Because there's another field of biological anthropology, the evolution and the characteristics of the human body, which I'm not going to talk about and which isn't taught at SOAS. Anthropology is a big, field. After all, it has the whole of human society as its subject. Its aim is to understand humanity through its social and cultural variety, establishing what we as humans share and how we are differently formed by our particular societies. And it's through studying difference that we come to an understanding of what is distinctive about being human and what we share, whether uh, the inhabitants of villages in the Amazon forests, tribals in the uplands, Indian farmers in South India, stock market traders in New York, immigrant families in North London, or factory workers in China. And today, anthropologists are as interested in the global processes that connect people across the world um, Amazon livelihoods are threatened by demand for beef consumed in New York. As forests turn into grazing land, these connections are what we often look at. The Beijing Olympics, to give another example, produced a spike in demand for copper, and with it brought dispossession to tribal or Adivasi communities in India, shaping their mobilization by the Maoist activists. And now a virus jumps from bats to humans in a wet market or escapes a virology lab in Wuhan and, who, uh, and, and other reasons. And two months, three months later, our lives are changed by COVID-19. Never have we been more aware of how humanity in its diversity is interconnected. And as anthropologists study these global interconnections, some of the 
frictions, some of the tensions involved in these global interconnections come to light. Now, anthropology is a science committed to, the, to, to discovering general principles and laws of human social life through verifiable fact. But it's also one of the humanities, like history, describing and interpreting cultures and societies. It's sometimes said of anthropology that it is the most scientific of the humanities and the most humanistic of the sciences. The topics that can be studied in anthropology are almost infinite. But what I'm going to suggest uh, to you is that as an approach to these and any subject, there are three things that define and distinguish anthropology. And this is what I want you to perhaps take away from this lecture. <laughs> the first is that anthropology is a, ha, has a comparative perspective, finding the universal and uh, the particular in its cultural diversity. Um, second, anthropology has a method focused on fieldwork and direct experience at the human scale. Thirdly, it's a perspective that is holistic in the sense that it finds connections between different aspects of life in society. And I'll talk about these um, each in turn. So first of all, anthropology's cross-cultural comparative perspective. By looking at how cultural life or economy or religion and even thought itself is organized differently in different societies, anthropologists are able to challenge some of the taken for granted assumptions about the world and how we in the cultural West look at it. Whether, we, whether we're talking about economic systems, the environment, health, or the human person and mind. Anthropologists can challenge other disciplines, such as economics or psychology, that have built culturally Western assumptions into their theories and methods. So for example, a few years ago, I was investigating why credit schemes in tribal communities in upland, the upland of a Western Indian region, a very poor and deprived region, why these credit schemes were failing. The project economists I worked with assumed that villagers would treat money uh, and, um, and save uh, and bank and borrow and repay as we in the West would. But these tribal villagers didn't treat money in that way. They didn't, as they were meant to, save and disperse loans and recover repayments from credit funds. Their farming economy was based on labor exchange and a system called Chandla, through which villagers would mobilize large sums of money and assistance at a time, at particular times of need, maybe when they were repairing land or house building or for medical emergencies or marriages or funerals. In this Chandla system, it was obligation, the obligation of one family to another that was accumulated and accumulated in social networks. And it was this obligation that was banked and not money. Money in this society was not a store of social obligation. Money savings into the project count didn't accumulate the social obligations that were part of the way that their economy worked. Borrowing from credit funds did not produce obligation to repay. And for this reason, the credit schemes failed. Through the failure of, this, of these schemes, the project economists were challenged to think about money and obligation and credit in a different way. And as an anthropologist on this project, it was my task to try to discover what was different and what was distinctive and why this particular development program wasn't working. Nowadays, I work as a psychological anthropologist, and here my work shows me that different societies sustain quite different assumptions about the human mind and thought. In turn, produce different mental experiences. The ideas that we in the West 
may have about separate individual minds and psychological processes in our heads are those which underpin Western psychiatry and its diagnostic categories such as depression or psychosis. Instead, don't privilege the theatre of the mind as a site of action or where there are more porous ideas of mind, distress is manifest perhaps more often as pain in the body or maybe it, as the presence of spirits um, in ways that are not recognised by Western diagnostic categories. And this I, I found when working in South India um, and, and looking in particular at spirit possession and exorcism and, and the treatment of, of, of mental distress there. Um, but other anthropologists um, um, have also um, examined these things and it's the, these turn out also to be relevant in looking at mental distress and its treatment in, in culturally diverse settings such as I do um, in a North London mental health service. The anthropologist Tanya Lerman has led us a, a team of researchers systematically looking at the degree to which the mind is understood and experienced as porous or as bounded, bounded as we might in the West think of ourselves as, as the possessors of individual separate minds. And to which inner experience is presumed to be important. We may prioritize inner experience in our discussion with each other about how we are and what's going on, but this is not always and universally the case. The degree to which thoughts uh, we often, um, dis uh, sorry, the degree to which thoughts we often describe as imagination or fantasy uh, are in other settings considered to be real, real phenomena out there in the world. Now, there is of course a tension between anthropologists' discovery of culturally different experiences and ways of being and the strive to understand universal human characteristics, a tension between discovering similarity and highlighting differences, which goes to the core of, the, uh, of what the subject is about. For example, uh, to stick with the psychological anthropology examples, the human brain has inherent characteristics for fantasy, for vivid imagination. You think only of uh, the imaginary friends that children make stability, um, hypnotizability, uh, the capacity to enter into states of trance. These are all capacities which are inherent in the human brain. But these capacities are worked on by culture and can allow, that can allow people to experience different aspects of themselves as autonomous or outside of themselves in certain cultural contexts when patterned in certain cultural ways. In some societies and cultures, Various experiences of dissociation, of imaginary friends, are tolerated and, and, and encouraged uh, and accepted. In others, they are purged out or pathologized as mental disorders, rather than being uh, cultivated or treated as real. The idioms, the form or the behavior or the symptoms that signal distress uh, vary across cultures even though the experience of distress and affliction is itself universal. So in thinking about these different experiences of being human, anthropologists to challenge what um, we call ethnocentrism. They adopt a cultural relativism, methodologically and ethically, in which we don't form judgments about the validity of other ways of thinking and experiencing. If the Azandi, a tribe in, uh, in Africa, believe in witches, we don't dismiss this as irrational, but really try to understand what is it that sustains such a belief? What would the world need to be like for witches to be real? How does that understanding make sense? But if each culture makes sense only in its own terms, how do we compare them? How do we compare one culture to which is only understandable in its own terms? And this is a challenge that 
uh, a challenge to anthropologists. Uh, we may use ideas like kinship or religion or economy to compare across cultures, uh, but then we might discover that kinship or religion is not a meaningful category in other places or other cultures. So we become caught up in the cultural um, fixity, if you like, of, of our own uh, language and our own categories. Some anthropologists say that we simply cannot reduce differences of experience or ontology, the understanding of what is real and what is not real. And we have to accept and only use people's own understandings. If to take the example from the anthropologist Eduardo Viveros de Castro, um, if people in the Amazonian community he studied tell him that, uh, that the jaguar uh, shape shifted into a human, this should be taken at face value and not explained away in other terms. Other anthropologists disagree and insist that comparison is possible and necessary. And so as, of course, the so-called Western cultural viewpoint isn't the only one um, that is challenged through anthropology. It isn't the only starting point as a very intercultural, uh, cross-cultural community, we have different cultural starting points for the cross-cultural um, study that is, uh, is anthropology. So that was, a, that was a few points about the first distinguishing characteristic of anthropology as a, uh, as it, as a, a discipline that focuses on cross-cultural experiences and comparison. The second characteristic of anthropology is its distinctive method. Knowledge that is anthropological could be said to come from first-hand encounters, from living among those we write about, often for long periods of time and repeatedly over decades. And this means that anthropology is a discipline at the human scale. We have things to say about big issues, whether on global environment or human migration or world religion or global poverty and health, mass media, new information technologies, of course, uh, pandemics. But we do so from the perspective of, of an understanding of human social relations, culture, interests, and power, from observation and particularly from participation that comes from fieldwork even though we also use archives and surveys and other instruments, there's something experimental in the practice of anthropology. You understand a phenomena by becoming a part of it and experiencing that phenomena, that society, that culture, that institution, along with those who are living, who live their lives uh, within it. Anthropology is a discipline in that sense of the everyday and of the present. The instrument of anthropological data collection is not primarily a questionnaire survey or an experimental design or a research protocol. The instrument of anthropological data collection is the person of the anthropologist, a person trained uh, to use their capacities for social engagement and subjectivity to make sense of another world. And this is what we call fieldwork. And of course, it's varied uh, depending upon the different positions that we have within a particular culture, society or institution that we're part of. So I've experienced um, uh, different roles in relation to different periods being an anthropologist in my career. Um, from being um, a visitor, uh, guest living in a South Indian village for a year or so, um, as an outsider learning to become and experience the day-to-day -day life of that community. Um, later on, I worked, as I mentioned earlier, as a development project worker, where I was both an insider of a community, in that case, a development project team, but also an outsider in relation to the villages in, in an Indian region that the program was, uh, was focused on. And the ethnography um, the, the, the writing up of this experience that I produced was both of the culture and society of an international development organization 
and of the interaction between that and the local communities. That was a different position. I was a partly insider and partly outsider. Um, subsequently, I worked as an anthropologist visiting research fellow at the headquarters of the World Bank in Washington, D.C. That was understood a bit like a village in order to understand the experience I'd had in living in South India and living in a village gave me skills to understand what what what, what were the driving social relationships and divisions and separations on ideas and rituals of a huge organization and in, in its headquarters. Uh, subsequently, I worked as an anthropologist uh, studying the, the work of Dalit activists, those who are uh, placed at the bottom or excluded uh, within the Indian caste system, discriminated as untouchables. And I became enrolled onto their campaign. So I became a kind of activist researcher working alongside others um, on some important issues of human rights. And currently, I work as an anthropologist within a mental health service uh, in North London, where I am embedded in a community mental health team, where in order to understand and to be practi a practice, practice, I have to become trained in a particular approach to mental health care so that I could become embedded and gain an understanding of the issues and concerns and questions around mental health care by becoming part of the process that I wanted to understand. So anthropology involves this tension between participation, being close up and engaged in, in activities, but it also involves standing right back, zooming out and asking questions of, about what kind of a practice and experience is this? A process of distanciation alongside the participation of getting close. So we, we, we stand, we get very close to phenomena, but they also stand right back and reflect on processes and reflect and write. There's a tension between participation and distanciation, being very close and being, being a part in order to reflect and write that is characteristic of the discipline. Anthropologists produce ethnography. The writing, the reflective, critical, analytical writing is essential to what makes anthropologists. The process that in, is involved in writing um, is one that takes experience from one context and places it in another as we engage comparative, in comparative analysis, as we, um, as we relate to anthropological theory, uh, as we engage with other researchers working on other themes. Um, so that's when we take our experiences as an, as a, from field work and we place them in another kind of context in our writing. And then we take those writings back to the communities in which we have studied and to whom we have gained uh, a closeness. And there's another round of, of engagement as this iterative and collaborative process kind of continues. OK, so that's the second characteristic of anthropology, that uh, it's, uh, its distinctive method. The third thing I want to point to anthropology is the characteristic of holism. And I don't mean holism in the sense that there is a definable whole with boundaries and frontiers that we can understand about any society or culture or situation. What I mean is that the reflective writing based on fieldwork that we that I've just said we call anthropology is, is a perspective that brings an interest in the relationships between different aspects of human existence. We refuse to be limited by the normal boundaries um, and to make connections between different aspects of everyday life, between the emotions and the environment, between social honour and economics, between marriage and markets, between family and finances, and so on. Um, the, well, when I say things are, are, are holistic is that anthropology is a discipline that tries to make connections by widening the as far as possible the field of what's relevant and what's interesting in a particular situation, including the physical environment, the emotional environment, uh, the myths, the stories, the history, um, the architecture um, in, which, uh, in which social life takes place. Um, all, there, is no th there is nothing that in the sense 
is, is not relevant to understanding a particular set of, uh, of relationships and phenomena. We take the widest possible view and make connections between different aspects of life, as of course individuals do um, in the day-to-day -day living of lives in particular cultures. Um, some of the benefits or an, an example of the benefits of thinking outside of the box of raising unfamiliar questions because you're not bound by the normal disciplinary silos um, is that um, it's not a coincidence that it was an anthropologist, um, Gillian Tett, uh, who was one of the few analysts to anticipate the 2008 financial crisis. Um, uh, who she now works at the, um, in the Financial Times, applying her skills in ethnographic research on marriage systems in Tajikistan, applying the things, ways of thinking she'd, she'd, she'd learned through looking at marriage systems to JP Morgan in 2006, the, the financial organization, she discovered that the insular culture was leading to the creation of financial instruments that had little basis and uh, could cause severe economic disruption. She's gone on to do work uh, and has recently published a book called uh, Silo Thinking, uh, called The Silo Effect, where every organization needs to disrupt its, where she challenges the non holistic perspective of many disciplines that don't make, don't look outside of particular uh, bounded fields uh, to raise critical questions um, of what's going on. And it's often by adopting a different and unusual perspective uh, that we can address some of the more critical questions that we face in society and in organizations. From our fieldwork approach and holism comes this ability to pose unfamiliar questions, questions that are unfamiliar within any given field and allows anthropologists to be disruptive in some ways by, by bringing in unfamiliar questions. Um, and this has led to um, anthropologists making significant contributions in different sorts of fields, uh, maybe thinking about policy um, in, in the world I work in, in international development. Uh, colleagues of mine have do so similarly in relation to things like post-disaster reconstruction um, or in health management um, or in apprenticeship and, and, and craft work to some, some of the fields in which my uh, colleagues work. And in many of these, areas, anthropologists are introducing um, surprising facts and surprising lines of, of, of questioning. And so as we do this um, on the basis of um, quite long term and in-depth regional knowledge, and my colleagues have expertise on different uh, parts of Africa and Asia, um, Nigeria or Mali or Tanzania, Ethiopia, Yemen, India, Japan, China, and often this expertise has been acquired over many years through many repeat visits, through uh, acquiring linguistic and cultural familiarity with particular um, uh, places and peoples, and then bringing that to some of our uh, thematic um, MA programs uh, that many of you will be interested in, um, whether in uh, medical anthropology, whether in migration and diaspora uh, studies, whether in the anthropology of food or the anthropology of, of development uh, or in museums and, and uh, material culture or in the core social anthropology MA um, that some of you may be interested in that we that we also um, we also run. So I'm going to um, to pause there because I as I said, I want this to be interactive and um, to answer questions or points that anybody might want to have um, either in relation to what I've just said or been saying or in relation to the experience of studying anthropology um, at SOAS and um, I, will, I will answer as best I can and hopefully we can have a bit of a, a bit of a discussion. So um, it's over to you. And would anybody like to, uh, if you if you can speak and you've got your um, microphone on, then put your question out there. If you can't, um, then put your question in a ch in the uh, chat, and I'll see if um, I can. I'll read it out so others can hear it, and then we can 
have a have a discussion based on the questions that have been put on the on the chat. If you want to raise, yeah, I think there's a raise hand function, but I'm not sure how that's going to going, going to work. So maybe we'd better stick with chat or if people can put their questions. Um, anybody got a question? Or a question for Amy, who has also is is on here. And uh, Amy, if you haven't seen, if people haven't seen that, she says hi. I'm Amy. I'm in London, a current SOAS student, and here to answer questions about student life and the anthropology department, which of course is probably the most uh, helpful uh, voice to hear at this stage if you're thinking about studying anthropology at, in London at SOAS. Yeah, I'll just uh, I'll verbally introduce myself as well. Um, I did a BA, at, uh, my BA at SOAS in social anthropology uh, for three years, and now I'm doing my masters um, in known Middle Eastern studies, which isn't in the anthropology department, but I've taken anthropology modules and um, still have quite close connections with the department, so I can still answer questions about. Um, postgraduate life in that department. Thanks, Amy. That was that was Amy speaking, wasn't it? Was yeah. Yeah, sorry, I can't see anybody, so it's difficult to know. Um, I mean, maybe we maybe while people are oh, hang on, we've got a question. Here. What what? Um, hi, question from. Uh, um, Mabluk uh, Budiman from Indonesia. What and how the anthropology um, can give solutions to the pandemic of the corona? Okay, that's a, that's a really interesting question. Um, and actually, I am currently putting together a research uh, application to look at um, uh, coronavirus and its impacts and particularly in relation to mental health, because that's of concern to me. I think anthropology is actually very well placed to think about um, the impacts of the corona pandemic, because the pandemic is of two kinds. On the one hand, the pandemic is a matter of infectious disease, and that requires medical expertise to figure out how to manage that. On the other hand, the impact of corona uh, virus and COVID-19 is significantly about the way it has changed social relationships, the kinds of social distancing, the disruption to social relationships, the shifts in the way that people connect and relate to each other. Um, of course, that has impacts on the economy or will have impacts on the economy. So much is at the center of, of the impacts of COVID, quite apart from the, um, the strictly infectious disease control aspects are the impact on society and social relationships. And anthropologists, by, by looking at those impacts close up, um, looking at the way in which people interact differently and how they adapt to the new forms of isolation, the new forms of social sociality, social relating, is going to be crucial to how we um, adapt to the new way of living that the coronavirus um, is going to impose um, in the coming months. Um, okay, another question um, for Rose. Hello, mostly a question for Amy. Um, Amy, can you see that question? Sorry, it's been covered already in the presentation, but I'm wondering what are the main strengths of SOAS compared to other British universities, according to you? Amy. Yeah, hello, Rose. Um, yeah, I've just been jotting some things down. Uh, I think what first came to mind uh, the, especially the anthropology department has its own very small library on the fifth floor called the Helen Konecka Library. And um, it, this year I saw a lot more postgrad students in that in that library. 
Um, but just the library in itself, the SOAS library, I'm not sure if you've visited the campus yet, um, but it's it's quite an amazing place to be at the, the collections they have there. The whole of the ground floor is, or most of the ground floor is um, for anthropology theoretical stuff. And then the next four floors are for specialist interests and really is super interesting stuff there. Um, yeah, so the SAS library is a really special place. And also the, the campus um, is, is quite a small campus and that has its pros and cons, you know, in between lectures it can be quite, you know, dodging the people. But um, also because it's so small, you, you really get close to people on your course and you get to see familiar faces every day and you can really make some strong connections with interesting people from across the world. Um, and this, you can learn as much from the experience outside of your lectures as at SOAS as you can um, in in the lectures. Um, and also, I found, especially in the anthropology department, the well, especially my supervisor as well, they really uh, uh, give you a lot of time. There's the the department's quite big. There's a lot of um, students in the department, but my supervisor gave me a lot of time and um, compared to the department I'm in now, it, it was really a friendly place to be. Yeah. Um, um, just, just to quickly, sorry, Amy, I didn't want to interrupt. No, no, it's okay. Um, just, I don't know whether you, you had the point I made at the, at the, the, the beginning um, about the fact that, that it's to, so as not only is so as a, a relatively small university so it's 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 meaningful when we talk about being a community because there really is that 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 intensive interaction albeit it'll be different with social distancing or, or physical distancing but because we're in a we're in a university where everybody is interested in uh, in cross-cultural comparison where the cultural diversity of perspectives uh, whether in a whole range of disciplines art architecture um, law, uh, social science, development, um, media, is what everybody is doing. I, I said anthropology is in some, uh, so as it is in some sense itself a very large anthropology department. Um, so the, the, the depth of regional expertise that you have in SOAS, which is a luxury for anthropologists to be surrounded by people who really know about the cultures and languages and histories and the literatures of their particular regions in which anthropologists work means that we have a, an opportunity to acquire a kind of depth to our anthropological work. And that means anthropologists at SOAS are among the leading anthropologists in the country. And I think that comes into um, the nature of the teaching that you get. So that's that I think that's one of the key things that distinguishes SOAS from other, uh, other, de other departments. Uh, we've got some other questions coming in here. Um, uh, Guy, I studied philosophy for my first degree uh, a long time ago and I mentioned any connections between philosophy and anthropology as a follow-up I'll be a mature student and would like to know what preparation I should make to get ready for academic study again um, so uh, anthropology is is profoundly um, uh, interconnected to philosophy and philosophy borrows from from anthropology um, at the core of anthropology is a question about what are we, what does it mean to be human, what is knowledge, um, given that we can't assume um, the, uh, ob the, 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 ob the, the, the objectivity around us um, uh, uh, in, in a taken for granted way. So there are, there are all sorts of, I could give a very long answer to that, but I think there's time for that, but, but to say that a, a a background with a first degree in philosophy is a very good foundation uh, for anthropology. You will find um, uh, philosophical questions threaded through the different um, aspects of, of, of anthropology. It's because anthropology, apart from anything else, is a very self-reflective discipline, constantly asking itself about the foundations of its own knowledge and understanding. Uh, given its encounter with different kinds of ep epistemologies and ontologies uh, and other cultures and ways of being and experiencing reality. Um, as a mature student, what would you do to prepare? Well, I would suggest some uh, you know, reading some general anthropology books, um, 
and uh, there are some, I think, on the website, or, or you can send a message to the convener of the program that you're interested in studying, and they will send you some basic readings that might be, uh, that might be interesting and get you going. Um, a question from Neville, how important do you think it is to study a language? And is it possible to study one as an additional module? I'm interested in Asia, but not exactly sure which region yet. Um, it is important. It's, it, it's, certainly, uh, it's certainly an advantage um, if you can study a language, and it is possible to study a language as one of, as one of your modules at SOAS. That is one of the other characteristics that SOAS has is the teaching of a wide range of languages. And there's every encouragement given to students uh, to study a language alongside their, um, alongside their, their other subjects, a specific study. Uh, you can again have discussions more in more detail with the particular conveners of your program, which Asian region you might be interested in, which, which language therefore might be relevant to you. Yeah, um, Amy said, and I think I would agree with this, Thomas um, Erickson's book, Small Places, Large Issues, a good book, good introduction to anthropology. Uh, I've definitely endorsed that, uh, that suggestion. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add as well about the study in languages. Um, I studied Arabic with my undergrad and I found it was not only, you know, interesting and it was just uh, also a nice balance between anthropology and something quite practical, um, just different skills. I, I think it was really a good idea to do the language if that's something you want to do. And I think I think becoming familiar with another language also, uh, particularly a non-European language, um, where words and categories and, and, and verbal forms are different, also means you have some experience of the different kinds of thinking that 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 that, that, la that different languages permit uh, or or become habitual. So it's it's language is closely connected to some of the broader questions that we ask as anthropologists. Any other any other questions? Perhaps uh, Amy, maybe we can have a conversation while waiting for others to come up with questions. I'm just curious to know um, how your, um, you manage to combine different things, language learning and sub and and regional, um, uh, you know, regionally focused uh, area study type uh, work and thematic subject specific uh, studies. There were there were different frameworks, and how did you find combining those different things in your study? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if, if it's something that is uh, in the postgrad modules, but I found in, in year two, we have to pick the compulsory um, ethnographic region, you know, the ethnography of South Asia or um, ethnography of uh, West Africa. And I found uh, that really helped me to um, have a regional interest, but also I found in my undergrads the 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 compulsory modules we had to choose like uh, social theory and mm. what's the other one contemporary trends they there was so many connections between that and the other um, the options we had to choose um, mm. and the languages the yeah there was it, it all connects I, I feel so in that sense is also a really good place to be because you you speak to people where so many themes connect and i found one of the biggest themes that so us that's often discussed in i feel in every course is the politics of knowledge production and so us itself as a community as as um as lecturers as students are always questioning themselves about oh, what does all of this mean anyway this thinking about different places of the world um who can think about different places of the world? There's always this self-reflexive um, questioning of, of the, the meaning of the point of SOAS, the point of study and all this. And, and it's really a challenge, um, which I'm glad I was I, I had experienced. Um, and it was one of the I reasons. One... Sorry, I, I just 
I wanted to, I was going to go to Sussex to do anthropology, but I found uh, when I visited SAS and I saw the posters on the wall and I saw how there's a protest already going on, it, it was, um, it felt more of a challenge and that's why I chose SAS. I think, and I, if somebody, to answer the earlier question about what was, the, what's special about SOAS, I think one of the things, and I should perhaps have said this earlier, is, is this, is the student body. I mean, we as, 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 as teachers learn every year from the students who we teach because of the, the great diversity of backgrounds and experiences that people bring. And so as a student at SOAS, you're taught not only by the teachers, but you're taught through the encounters and exchange with all the other students, the very um, skilled, rich, inexperienced and, and understanding uh, uh, peers of yours um, as you as your classmates as you go through your, your degree. Um, OK, so we've got some questions, more questions come here. Um, will there be any modules particularly disrupted the online learning in term one, for example, language modules? Or is there good preparation across modules? Well, I can't speak for all modules. I'd like we're obviously in a fast moving uh, situation. And I think every effort is being made to um, adapt for online, uh, online presentation and discussions in the um in in term one i don't think that that um you know i mean obviously i don't i'm not i wouldn't say that any i can't say which or any particular modules are more could be more uh, affected by moving online than others um but i think generally speaking yes i would say that there is good preparation across the modules um neville another question can we language i'm also a mature student um 54 Hi, um, my self-employment over 20 years has mostly gone in the current, has it mostly gone in the, sorry, I'm misreading this. My self-employment over 20 years has mostly gone in the current crisis, which is interesting to say the least. Uh, the positive is I now find, can now finally do this, which I've considered for a long time. Fantastic, the university of the third age. Um, are there many my age I'm considering studying part-time how many hours a week study might realistically be? Um, the, the, yes, there are many people. The age range of students at SOAS is, I think at postgraduate level, is very broad. Um, I think we have a lot of people who come to study um, later on, post-career, bringing all that richness of experience um, to study. And, um, yeah, that, that, that is, you will not, definitely, you would not be uh, alone or, or, or unusual. Um, at, at, at SOAS. Um, how many hours of study? Well, you normally follow four sort of um, uh, courses at any one time. If you were doing it full time, you'd be doing two rather than four. Um, so you might find your lectures are on two different days and then you have tutorial groups. So you might, you might be one or two, day, two days. Um, the lectures would be an hour an hour long tutorial groups, an hour, uh, a, 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 an hour or, or, or more individual meetings with your tutor um, on a, a, as often as you felt was necessary, um, seminars and other things to participate in. That'll give you some idea of the, um, of the weekly load in terms of hours. Uh, I, hope that's, I hope that's helpful. Again, please send a message to your program convener. Um, you can find who that is on the website. Um, for some more follow-up information on, in relation to that question. So I can't immediately think of the, num the number of hours that would actually be a week, four or five or something. I'm not exactly sure. Um, is, there, um, is there a presentation file and certificate? I don't know, understand that. Is there a presentation file and certificate? I'm not sure I understand that question. Um, Sorry, uh, maybe could that be put in a slightly different way? Is there um, a question uh, from Elizabeth? Um, oh, okay, sorry, we've got an answer to that. We're preparing to adapt and teach all courses and modules online via blended learning. This is happening now for current students as they complete their studies this year. Yes. Um, there you are, Guy, um, uh, around the same age as Neville. I wanted to, it's Amy here again, I wanted to confirm with Elizabeth as well that the, from because we received the email from SAS yesterday that 
they were going to reopen the library in the campus is maybe that's something other people want to know as well yeah yeah I, the, the, the lib the, I think various bits of the camp various bits of the campus will be will be open um, obviously with the um in in in, the, in ways that will allow use of those facilities that comply with the government's public health instructions around distancing um, surfaces, touching, and so on. This is a changing field, and we don't know where we'll be in September exactly. We don't know where we'll be in, in January. Um, but we expect some combination of online and offline, um, small group, uh, physically distanced, um, um, teaching arrangements to be in place as, as we go as we go forward. I don't know, Amy, whether you've any any thoughts on um, on how you might imagine SOAS in a physically distanced uh, environment, um, but I think that um, you know I think it will be possible as as we move forward um, in a probably a slow and step by step way um, to um, to have on campus as well as off as well as online uh, teaching over the coming months. Another thing that just to mention that we have in our uh, as part of the postgraduate program, obviously, at the, the writing of an independent piece of research, your dissertation um, is a key part of, of studying at postgraduate level where you become in the driving seat. You, you shift from being a consumer of knowledge to being a producer of knowledge, working closely one to one with, a super, with a, your dissertation supervisor. Many of our students do uh, field work. What that field work means now is is uh, uh, is obviously in question. But this year's cohort of students, um, quite a number of whom I'm supervising at the moment, been, um, as to how they're doing their research uh, dissertations using online um, uh, platforms, online uh, resources finding new ways of, of uh, posing questions and, and searching for answers, doing a different kind of ethnography. You remember I talked about the key element of anthropology being fieldwork and ethnography, but using using the present circumstance to, to think creatively about, about projects that they could develop. Um, normally, when we get back, hopefully we will get back to um, ordinary interns, um, People do fieldwork based um, assignments in some of the modules um, throughout the, the teaching terms, as well as leading to in preparation to and as well as things that lead up to your uh, dissertation work. Um, we've got a question here uh, from Bridget. Um, I'm trying to choose modules for the anthropology of food. Would it be a good idea to choose a range of modules across disciplines or specific modules? Um, I think I think it partly depends on how um, how sort of closely tied or uh, degree to be in the sense thematically uh, interconnecting and the synergies between different uh, different uh, modules or how you want to have a a wide ranging breadth of uh, of, uh, of knowledge. Um, I would suggest you discuss that in more specific detail based on your own, uh, where your career is going, where, what you want to do next, what skills you think you want to develop, and do that with the program convener of the MA, um, the food MA, uh, Dr. Jacob Klein. That That would be my advice. Uh, okay, so EG food, food security module, 
Um, yes, again, the specifics of how much overlap there is between selected modules and the ones that you're interested uh, in and whether there's overlap with the core module, that's something you should take up with, with, with Jacob. As I say, I teach a module on culture and psychiatry, uh, which is um, um, anthropology and mental health, uh, psychological anthropology. This uh, year, we had quite a lot of people from different MA programs, including the anthropology of food, uh, interested in the relationships between food and mental health. Now, that may be something that is of interest to some on the MA food uh, program and, and, and not others. Others might be interested in the anthropology of development in relation to food or food in relation to migration and, uh, and, and diaspora. So um, the connections can be made uh, in any way that you think will be of particular interest to you. And maybe thinking about your option choices in terms of where you're, what the thing you want to focus on in your dissertation. So that becomes a way of preparing for your research project. Yeah, I just want to add, um, I found it from a personal experience, it, it took me quite a, a lot of time in my BA just to figure out what anthropology is. And um, I could imagine that if you have to write a dissertation, that I, because I, I know there's a lot of uh, choices at SOAS where you can pick from across different departments and um, you can do development studies or any, any other from any other department but um, yeah I, I found it quite nice in my BA just to choose only anthropology um, modules and really get an understanding of what anthropology is because that's a huge question in itself as you could probably tell from David's lecture and things it's it's lots of different things in different moments of time as well yeah thanks Amy For all, for all, I just doing just to encourage people. I think we're going to have to um, end the session um, shortly. Um, but just to say that, um, do please uh, follow up questions by emailing um, the program conveners. Um, you'll find them on the SOA anthropology uh, MA programs. If you, if you um, click through, you'll find the person who is the MA um, uh, convener for that particular program, and you can carry on the conversation and answer um, any of the any specific questions you've got, or maybe have a and and you'll they'll probably offer to have a phone call with you uh, to chat through um, some of the specifics that relate to your circumstances and the choices that you have to make, um, you know, given given where you are at the moment. So please don't don't hesitate. Uh, to get in touch with um, with people, we're here to you know to really encourage people to talk through um, the choices that they 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 have to make at the moment. We have a late arrival, Frederick. Uh, very much interested in the cultural and social end of anthropology, which is a sub um, and with some aspects as well. Well, that's very much you. You've come to the right place. That's what SOAS focuses on. And Liz is reminding us that if you have any individual admissions questions, please email her. Uh, it's the details are in the chat.
box. And I think uh, I think that um, deadline for admissions off the top of my head. Um, can anybody answer that question? 31st of July. Um, anyone, Frederick, uh, interest in uh, people in relation to cultural and social aspects? Um, contact the um, the convener of the MA Social Anthropology would probably be the best. Um, if you look on the website under the MA programs and so as, and you look at social anthropology, our, our, which is our sort of general um, introduction to uh, anthropology, particularly for people who don't have a, any background in anthropology, although all of the MA programs, none of them, all of them assume that there is no background in anthropology, so it can be studied by anybody. Um, that would be the person to continue that conversation. And I'm going to put my email up in case anybody wants to contact me for any further information, dm21 at soas.ac.uk. Um, so um, any, any, further, uh, any, any further questions you want to put to me, drop me an email and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. And just to say, as, um, is that although the 31st July is the deadline and we, because I think we're in difficult and unusual circumstances, we will certainly um, consider applications after this date as well. Great. Thank you, David, very much for your presentation and for answering all those questions. Um, and thank you to Elizabeth um, as well and Amy. Um, I hope you all enjoyed the session. We'll be sending a recording of, uh, of the presentation around. I know um, it was Frederick joined a bit late, so you'll be able to, to see the whole session and the whole talk. Um, that'll be available uh, next week at the end of our open day series. So thank you all again very much for connecting with us today. I hope you enjoyed it. And um, thank you, David, for taking the time to speak with us. Great. Nice to nice to meet you all in this um, un, in indirect way. And hopefully um, see many of you um, through one medium or another um, in the autumn and, and into the new year. Welcome to SOAS.